Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. It isn't every day we have the privilege of a president on the show. This is no ordinary president, but the president of a land whose people have been ethnically cleansed from their homeland to make way for a US war base, and on which the torture of kidnapped people from around the world appears to have taken place, and a base given to the US military by us, the British. It is, of course, Diego Garcia, part of the Chagos Islands, highlighted on the show when we interviewed British TV host and human rights campaigner Ben Fergal in a landmark interview. Today, we can go one better and welcome onto the Sputnik the man chosen by the Chagosians to represent them on the world stage, their president, Alan Vinkatasen. President, thank you for joining us. I'm struck by the British Union flag on your lapel. Uh, you live, of course, in Sussex, like thousands of others of your exiled compatriots. Don't you feel a little bit bitter about the British? Why are you flying their flag? Well, uh, Diego Garcia, my homeland is still a British overseas territory, and uh, I wanted to remain uh, such uh, uh, for more years. Uh, because uh, we were exiled uh, between 1965-1973, uh, we wanted to remain a, a British overseas territory uh, because the UK has got responsibility to resettle us on our homeland. Indeed they do. So this crime took place mainly under a Labour government in the 1960s. How do you think today's Conservative Prime Minister views your flight? Uh, we submitted a memorandum to the Prime Minister before the general election asking him to uh, give us our right to return in a pilot resettlement. Uh, the problem that we have had is that there was no uh, clear indication about the demand on the number of Chagosians who wanted to return. Certainly uh, the cost is a bit uncertain. Uh, the government has replied that they will need uh, to do more work so that a final decision can be made. Now, you've produced this uh, book, The Flight to Freedom. Tell us what's in it. Uh, the book, uh, The Flight to Freedom, is about the story when uh, I came for the first time with the first group uh, in the UK uh, for a better life, a new life, uh, running away from uh, poverty, uh, which uh, we were uh, made to suffer in Mauritius uh, by the UK uh, government. So the book relates how I orchestrated the coming, the migration of our people in the United Kingdom. You had uh, the right to do so, of course, at the time, not a right that many people would, uh, would have today. What's happened to your people since they were turfed out to make way for this American war base? A, we were forced in uh, a abject poverty in Mauritius. A, we, we were considered as second-class citizens there. A, the state of Mauritius is uh, having an issue with regards to sovereignty over our homeland. They want sovereignty from the UK. Uh, and that's why I'm here to fight for the cause of my people, because I believe uh, this is our country. It should remain uh, a, a UK overseas territory. And we, as UK overseas uh, territory uh, citizens, we need to be able uh, to return uh, as such a citizen in our homeland. And why can't you? return? Are you physically barred? Does your passport preclude you? How do they actually bar you? We are British citizens with a British passport, uh, but uh, because of the military base, a US military base uh, uh, in our homeland, it makes it impossible for us to return. There, there are uh, several orders in council that have been uh, done in this country uh, to prevent us from returning, and there is still another one. Uh, but uh, we continue to campaign uh, on our rights of return. So uh, recently, uh, the Conservative government uh, appointed uh, the firm KPMG 
to do a feasibility uh, study on return, uh, the feasibility study shows clearly that there is no legal barrier to our return, uh, except that the government must, must invest the money that is needed for a pilot resettlement. And uh, I think uh, that's a way forward. That's a moral way forward for the UK. Otherwise, we, we cannot stay uh, continuously in exile uh, from our homeland. The lease for the US airbase uh, on the islands is about to expire next year. Is this somehow stopping or bringing you more hope to return to the islands? Uh, the, the lease uh, will, uh, will continue for another 25 years. It will not stop uh, next year. Uh, if the UK or the US want to stop uh, this agreement, uh, then they will have to renegotiate it or it will come to an end. Whereas if both parties uh, want to continue, there, there will be uh, no negotiation. Yeah. And I believe uh, this is the right time uh, for the UK government uh, to uh, do the necessary to allow us back and certainly to invest uh, the money that is needed for a pilot resettlement, uh, which is uh, a, the capital cost is below 60 million. And uh, I believe also that the, the, the Americans got a moral duty also uh, to chip in some money uh, for a pilot resettlement on Diego Garcia. The situation that we have is that we have a government that needs to make decisions and they need to make the decision quickly because our old people, the old natives are dying. Yeah. And uh, I'm among the last generations uh, uh, of natives. So uh, it is uh, very important that uh, we, uh, we be able to, to return. And, and with the changes that this government is bringing, certainly in uh, giving more powers to Scotland and to uh, Wales and uh, all these changes that are being uh, brought uh, uh, in this parliament. So I think it is, it is a moral duty of this government to allow us uh, to return. Uh, when Ben Fogel was here, he painted this extraordinary picture of the houses that your people had been forced to leave now being inhabited by the kind of international jet set uh, boat yacht owners stopping off living in your houses for however long and then sailing on to their next destination so there clearly is no as it were physical reason why people cannot live in these houses uh, preferably the people whose houses they are rather than international jet setters. What's to stop? Is there anything to stop? A number of us just going there. Uh, me, you, and a few hundred uh, Chagosians from Crawley. Uh, it, could they stop us if we did it? Yes, uh, the, 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 uh, the, there is a legal barrier uh, now uh, because of the uh, orders in council. So if, for example, we take a boat uh, or a plane, you can't land there, uh, and a boat, you can't, you can't get there without a permission. Uh, this is, Which uh, navy would intercept you, the British or the US? Uh, that would be uh, the uh, British and the US. Both. Even though you're a British citizen, yes. effectually. Yes, we that have. That would be very embarrassing for the Prime Minister, I must say. Yes, we, we have. That makes it all the more attractive to me as an idea. <laughs> yes, I, I, I think if this, is, this is something that uh, if this government doesn't uh, do uh, their best to resettle us, us uh, quickly, I think that's the last resort that us as a people will have to, will have to do. Yes, it'd be a kind of reverse boat people. Yeah. People leaving <laughs> Europe to go back to their homeland and the European Navy trying to stop them. That's, that's what I am asking. I'm asking this government to allow us to let us return, let us leave the UK for good to go in our country. There are many people coming to this country. We came to They're this country. They're always complaining yeah. about it. They're yes. always complaining so, about chaps your yeah, colour coming we, here. Exactly. This would be a reverse. Yes. We want a law, we want a new orders in council allow us to return to our homeland. That's simple as that, but the government must foot the bill. Of course. Does anyone uh, champion your cause? The government is one thing. Have you persuaded the opposition? such as it is in the British Parliament, to adopt your cause? 
I, th I think the, the difficulty which the opposition uh, has, has had in, in, uh, in the past is that it all happened under Howard Wilson. And uh, this government has done things right in 1982 when they paid a peanut compensation, but they tried to do something. And it is this conservative government also that has appointed KPMG to do the feasibility study. And I think uh, this government got the, the, the right uh, timing and uh, a, the, the right uh, decision as they, they can do it. Well, I must tell you, if you're ever organizing an expedition to reclaim uh, Diego Garcia in the Indian Ocean, I want to be on board. I'll That's be one of your uh, deckhands on <laughs> the flagship as we go back. Gayatri, too. Yes. Uh, she's from uh, roughly, very yeah, roughly, that yeah, part of the that's, world. That's going to be great because we are asking to return to our homeland a, in a very peaceful way yes. and we want the government yes. to do the right thing. We want everybody to do the right thing uh, so that return is done smoothly. But if this government says that there will be no return, no pilot resettlement, nothing, I think that's the only alternative yes, we that take we it, have. Uh, into our own hands. How can people help you? How do they contact you? Uh, they can contact me uh, on, I'm on Twitter and I'm on Facebook. Uh, they can contact me and uh, certainly... A, and there's a support group. There's there is a, a support, Chagos, uh, the UK support group. Chagos support group. Uh, They're doing based, a great job, yeah, I must say. Doing very, very good job with the help of Ben Fogel and, and Philippa Gregory. Uh, so I think it's... Um, I think we, 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 we got a chance here, and uh, I think the UK will need to do the moral thing. Thank you very much, Mr. President. You're welcome. After the break, the terrifying advance of the most savage and destructive army since Genghis Khan, ISIS. Now just 60 miles from Baghdad and steadily advancing on Damascus, controlling cities as far apart as Sirte in Libya and Borno in northern Nigeria. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik, the ancient Roman amphitheater in which I have myself stood in Palmyra in Syria became like some ancient Roman bloodbath, the site of mass executions last week when the ISIS Visigoths took control of the fortress town. ISIS now approaching the first anniversary of the declaration of their caliphate yes, it's only been 12 months, celebrated in advance with the conquering of Ramadi, capital of Anbar province in Iraq, just 60 miles from Baghdad, and in Palmyra in Syria, home of one of the world's greatest archaeological treasures. They are beginning to look unstoppable in both countries, and a growing menace elsewhere too. Certainly, if what has been fielded against them to date is the best there is, they are not going to be stopped. And a growing question is, does the West and Israel actually want to stop them? And if not, why not? Joining us to discuss the threat is the brightest Arab woman analyst of them all, Hafsa Kara Mustafa. Hafsa, thanks for coming back on board the Sputnik. The last time we spoke, uh, this was a threat, but a far distant one. Now it's a clear and present danger that certainly in Syria, it may now be winning the war. And in Iraq, it may now be uh, unvanquishable in the areas it now holds. Is that how you see it? Sadly, it is. Uh, it's been a pattern, uh, it's been an ongoing pattern since the US have set foot in Iraq. You know, if you look at it in a scientific way, wherever the US spread, ISIS, wherever US tread, ISIS has spread, and they've increased in potency, in, they've taken over key strongholds. So I think it is very, look, is very much looking as if ISIS is there to stay, and it's very much a force to be reckoned with. So while I was here last time, we were talking about a ragtag army that really didn't have much, much focus, they were coming from all over the place, but now we're seeing a very strong military force that is making major gains in some of the most key places of the Middle East. So yes, they are very much a, a threat, and they're looking as if they're here to stay. Let's take Syria, first of all. Uh, for a long time, it looked like the Syrian regime and its army fought very heroically, mm -hmm. sustained huge losses, remained loyal to the state, 
had the beating of ISIS. What's tipped the balance? Why are they now effectively in control of more of Syria than President Bashar is? Well, this is the very strange thing about what's been happening in the past six months alone. Uh, up until, four, you know, for the best part of four years, we've been hearing Assad is going, Assad has got only a month to go, Assad is, 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 on the ex is on the exit, and yet he has remained, and he has become even more popular among Syrians. And at this crucial time where he's actually inflicting huge losses on ISIS, come a US-led coalition supposedly designed to weaken ISIS, and yet what have we seen in the past month alone? We've seen that a coalition of the most important and fearsome armies on the planet have actually strengthened ISIS. So what, is, what we've seen as a result is that Syria, the Syrian army, which, as you say, has fought heroically against ISIS forces, is actually losing the ground on many key places in part thanks to the coalition, which is really strengthening ISIS uh, in, in Syria. Well, the big question is whether that's deliberate or uh, inadvertent. Uh, I have resisted, for obvious reasons, for four long years, the suspicion that this was a deliberate tactic on the part of the West. But I'm bound to say, seeing it here for the first time on television, that I have now concluded that the coalition which was supposedly set up to end the threat of ISIS is in fact facilitating it. i give you just one example. Given that ISIS, the heart-eating, head-chopping fanatics, now control more than half of Syria, mm -hmm. which is next door to Israel, you would expect Israel to be jumping up and down uh, in anguish at that prospect. Imagine. ISIS, the caliph, Baghdadi, installed in Damascus, next door to them. A terrifying prospect, you might have thought. Netanyahu might have been expected at the United Nations, holding up his diagrams, pointing up the mortal threat to his state. But we don't have any of that. In fact, there's not a whisper out of Tel Aviv about the dangers of ISIS ruling the country next door to them. What could be the reasons for that? Well, clearly, because ISIS are destroying the Middle East, weakening the surrounding countries, weakening the countries that pose the greatest threat to Israel, and therefore they're playing into Israel's game. Now, the one central thing that is really a major focus for the majority of Muslims across the world is the Palestinian cause and the suffering and the ongoing suffering of Palestinians. And when you see that the people of ISIS, who are claiming in some bizarre way to somehow represent Islam or Islamic interests, have not in any way, shape or form targeted Israel or any Israel interests, I think it really says a lot about the coalition between the two. And one, major, one thing that's been very, very striking recently was that uh, ISIS forces, well not ISIS forces, but the, the opposition to Assad, which are fighting alongside Jabhat al-Nusra, which is itself an ally to ISIS, have actually congratulated Israel on its supposedly independence anniversary. Now, that is utterly shameful. Wherever you stand, as an Arab and as a Syrian, and however much you oppose Assad, there isn't a self-respecting Syrian who could possibly congratulate Israel in any way, shape or form. And I think that really, just that little information that has you know, was swept under the carpet and wasn't making the headlines, really says a lot about the alliance between ISIS, between these terrorists and the State of Israel. Well, we're now going to, unless there's some spectacular reverse on the battlefield, we're going to have the emergence of a new state in half of Syria and a third of Iraq, uh, with the border between the two obliterated. Uh, thus, a buffer state between Iran, Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Palestine. That may be one clue uh, to what the Western countries uh, are seeking to achieve here. This will break the arc, or the, the arc of resistance, if you like, mm -hmm. uh, by which from Iran to Lebanon and across the border into Palestine, uh, support for the Palestinian people was able to be uh, conveyed. Um, it's clear, though, that whatever ISIS said or didn't say about the independence of Israel, in their ranks, there are some very fanatically uh, extreme people. Mm -hmm. Are they likely to be demobilized once the war, the current war, is over, or will they want to go on and fight somewhere else? 
Is Saudi Arabia in danger? Is Israel in danger? I very much doubt that Saudi Arabia is in danger or Israel is in danger. For one thing, Saudi Arabia has been funding uh, the other... Uh, Avatar, if you want, which is Jubhar Nusra and all the other opposition uh, parties in Syria. And as we've discussed, Israel is very much benefiting from the chaos that is brought upon by, by ISIS. Now, the, what we have to notice uh, in the region, the wider Middle East, is that these groups and similar groups are acting simply uh, in the interest of increasing chaos and warfare in the Muslim world. Now, in that part of the world, they're claiming that they're resisting Shia influence. That's, their, that's one of their arguments. But of course, what is their argument when you have Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb, where there are no, uh, where are no Shia populations in that part of the world? Mm. So really, their aim is to just increase chaos, give Western countries, in particular in the US, the, uh, the reason and the excuse to come in, to invade, to send in forces, to sell more weapons to Saudi Arabia. So what they're doing is really they're giving the opportunity for the Muslim world to collapse and to be destroyed and every every single endeavor that they take is actually going towards that aim which is to fragment the region leave it weakened and of course in a weakened wider weakened Middle East you have a strong emerging Israel what um, one of the few um, resisting groups fighting Isis mm -hmm. successfully are the Kurdish women mm -hmm. yeah but funny enough, they are being supported by the U.S. as well. How do you read that movement? I mean, the, the role of, of the Kurds in, in the Arab world has been very ambiguous, probably because, um, you know, in, in the fight in, in Iraq, it, it was they were used against Saddam Hussein. Yep. Uh, in Turkey, they've, they've played, a, a, again, an ambiguous role. It's very difficult to, to actually pinpoint how to you know, how the Kurds are operating, they've been fed a sort of very anti-Arab propaganda, and I think that's been very central to how they were strengthened. And in, with the fall of Saddam Hussein, what happened is you had uh, Israel quickly jumping an ally with many Kurdish leaders, saying, well, actually, you know, whilst you were being gassed by Saddam Hussein, by the Arabs, you know, we can come here and help you. So there's been a sort of weird alliance between yeah. Kurdish forces and Israeli forces. Now, with the case of ISIS, they only came into fight because ISIS threatened certain parts of, of Kurd Kurdistan. Well, that, that the only serious effort the United States has made against ISIS is when their Kurdish allies have been threatened. Mm -hmm. In Kobani, exactly. in, uh, in Erbil. Uh, you're an Arab woman. An Arab woman who thinks like you, talks like you, looks like you, would have no future under ISIS. Uh, the horrific attitude that they have towards women, including justifying multiple rape of Yazidi girls, for example, written by one of their women in their own theoretical journal this month, mm -hmm. saying that it was actually Islamic to seize these girls and multiply rape them and claiming that they celebrated when the first of the slave girls was brought into their homes. What a face this is for the Muslims. What a horrific image that's being given to Islam by these people. Well, I think this is this is exactly it. This is the caricature of evil. I mean, the the barbarity of ISIS is, is unmatched, and they seem to take pleasure in exposing their depravity in a way that's never been seen before. We know we know that armies rape. We know that war is a nasty thing. We know that horrific things happen on the battlefield. But what ISIS is doing is actually promoting it and showing it off as something to be proud of. And this is unheard of. I mean, in in, in the annals of history, you know, people are ashamed of their, the crimes that they commit. So I think. ISIS is really con contributing to this image uh, that fuels Islamophobia, in particular in the West, and allows countries such as Israel or the US to say, well, look, this is pretty much what Islam is. Because, of course, whether we like it or not, ISIS is claiming it to be the Islamic State. The word Islam is intrinsically linked to ISIS, and therefore it's linked to what it does. And I think ISIS are playing a major role in actually fueling the image, a bad image of Islam, which in itself fuels Islamophobia. We're going to have to interview you again because there's so much we didn't have time to reach there. Hafsa, thank you very much Thanks. indeed. And now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's Rutland Gayatri? About the fate of the Chagosians, uh, Stellaran says the following. Britain is such a free country, they can't leave it. What a truer test of freedom than that. 
on the possible working together of ISIS with the West. Paul Hoover says ISIS was created by the West, so of course they are hoping their investment pays off. Well, that's all I've got for this week. Which, alas, means that's the end of the show. You can stay in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik and on Facebook you can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. Goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.